Such sights to show you. Bring the motherfucking ruckus! Fuck you too! Uh, hi, hi, boos. Hey, hey, boos. Jin, Jin. Jin, Jin. Thank you, sir. Say boom, boom, boom. Way ho. Boom, boom, boom. Way ho. Way ho. I wanted to talk to you, by the way, about the checks that you're sending. The checks. Yeah, they're all bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I look through my records, and I since we started this, I don't believe it or not. Everything um, is bounced. When you signed up uh, on the dotted line, mm -hmm. um, one of the the fine print terms uh, on white paper, written in white font, mm -hmm. is uh, all of my checks bounce. <laughs> Oh, uh, weird. Yeah, weird. no, it's crazy. That I thought that was weird. You didn't see that. Well, no, because I remember you... Or your lawyer didn't see that. Well, you asked them both to leave the room. Uh-huh. And you were like, just give me 30, 30 seconds. And they were like, we don't really do that. And then <laughs> you were like, no, 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 I got it. And then, so they left. And then you added that thing. And I was, yeah. So that makes sense now. <laughs> Damn. Um, yeah, if anyone, I'll level with you. If anyone deserved to get paid for this, no, 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 no. you would be no. one of them. No, 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 no. He's too humble to take that, but no, he'll no, argue no, with me no, about no. my checks bouncing. No, but I just, you know, my bank is starting not to trust me. Mm. I don't have a bank. That's why everything's bouncing. Oh, well, that would make sense. <laughs> that's a pretty easy way to make sure that happens. <laughs> to make sure my checks are fake oh your checks are pieces of paper they're index cards that's right damn <laughs> that should have been my first clue <laughs> this looks nothing <laughs> like oh well money order <laughs> shit <laughs> let's get it done oh shit mm. i've been talking this series up a lot really on other episodes oh man i'm 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 really excited to continue oh, this man. one <laughs> Why? Well, I hope it's good. <laughs> I hope we do a good job. Do you not enjoy it so far? No, I do. I just hope it's... I hope we're giving it the credit it deserves. I think... We're letting it fly. I think we're giving it... I think we give everything more credit than what it deserves. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because we are... Um, we are giving it the, the bastion of our vocal abilities... Right. We are we are giving it the Winston of our performances. We are giving it God. the diva the of the our widow maker of acting our, abilities. Of our seriousness. Our yeah. McCree. Yeah. Uh-huh. I get it. <sighs> you know, um <laughs> so much so much has happened uh between episodes one and two. I just I did a quick um scroll through of part one to see the two sins that we read about last time and we did lust which was the the southern fat woman yep who apparently was a bee she turned she, into a bee or something i don't know if she turned into a bee she just captured people in like sap yeah and like and like ate their insides, you let know, them left liquefy. the carcasses out. Yeah, let yeah. them liquefy from the inside out and, and would consume them that way. She was she was very cannibalistic. Right. And then the um the greed uh was like a conjoined pair? Or was it a guy No, it was just one No, guy. no, that's right, that's right. <clears throat> no, it was an, it was a brother and sister or husband and wife. Oh, they were they were conjoined. They were uh, like doctors they had sewed, or they had surgeons sewed or something. Skin of their victims yeah. onto yep, their yep, yep. skin. Yep. So they had like extra eye holes and extra mouths and extra like little little doodads everywhere, yeah. you know. And um, you know, each of these sins has touched on also uh, a demonic entity. Um, in each of their parts, because in um, in the first one, I believe she's talking to Azazel, 
or Azazel. Yes. Oh, that's right. And then in the second one, they are each talking to different um, entities. They're yes. each pleading to different demonic entities. Right. I remember um, the name of the one is the name of a, a bad guy from Watchmen, which is why I thought of it. Um, Mammon? Moloch. Moloch. Moloch is the name of uh, a bad guy in Watchmen. Moloch and Mammon. Moloch, Moloch and Mammon are, are the uh, the two that the twins or right. siblings, whatever they were, um, worshipped in their consumption of people, in their in their uh, you know destruction of people. I, I find that incredibly interesting, and I wonder if we're going to see more um, sins kind of belay the the demons that have. Uh, asked that of their subjects, sure. you know, kind of, um, ordered this, uh, to happen through them, you know, um, demons, uh, act through people as like vessels right. most of the time. So it's super interesting to see that it started that way, which was like zero to 60. Mm -hmm. Like the story was like in part one, it was literally like, I'm a sin eater. I'm going to like the worst place on the planet. There's a German guy here. And this woman's talking about eating people. Yeah. Like it like very quickly was like we Rains are up. we are in the shit. Right. Um and then it got weirder and now and now we're here in part two. And I've been I've been talking this series up along with another series that I've been doing, um that that just ended uh before this one. But uh I'm I'm so enjoying our, our fifth season so far. Everything about season five is super on point. Um, it's going to sound like I did the cool thing where I snapped without doing it, but I actually just snapped because I can't do it. I don't know what you're trying to do, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. That's that, fine. That thing... The th thing where you, like, yeah. sl sl you slap your, your hand, finger, but, yeah. but you snap... Okay. Yeah. Great. I can't do that. Um, yeah, so I'm here with Django Phillips. Django! And we're reading more Sin Eater today, and I'm... Above all things, hoping that I have the ability to do that German accent just as well as I did uh, last time. <laughs> mm. It was a treat. If it there's one treat. thing that I am not capable of, and this is both um, artistically, uh, vocally, you know, in every uh, part of, of me uh, as a person, um, I lack all consistency as a person. Gotcha. Um, I may sing great one day and sing like shit the next day, despite having trained all the same mm -hmm. the week beforehand. I may have edited one episode really well right. <laughs> one week and the next week, not so not much so good. <laughs> at all. Um, and that, you know, that, that carries off into every part of my, my life. So we'll, we'll see if I have the ability to tap back into that, uh, spectrum of, uh, not quite Christoph Waltz, not quite Swedish accent. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so, man. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Oh, we should say, I'll I'm cover, a character actor. I'll cover for your fat bong rip. Um, <laughs> Why would you cover for such a thing? Uh, <laughs> just fill the space. Well, you talked about their their demon patrons. Yes. And that's also how each of the killers so far has met their ends. Yes. They had appealed to their patrons in the end, and then in true demonic fashion, they were like, mm, no, actually, you didn't understand my shit. And then they, like, disemboweled them. So that'll be interesting if we see that subverted as well. Um, I feel like we're gonna... We it's, might. I, I feel like we're gonna because at some point, um, these things are gonna get worse. Right. Right. Like, they started us off at such a point that I can't help but think it's only gonna like raise the stakes and get worse with each step. Sure. And become like more and more either personal or disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> because that's really the only two ways you can go. Yeah. Um, and I I don't know I it. It's if if like if like the name Chernabog comes up at all, like I'm just going to get up and walk out of the room, you know, like we're going to keep seeing different different entities yeah. showing up trying to like, you know, uh, use use people t to their means. You know, I, I don't know how how long this chick is going to be able to consume this shit and be like, oh, this is fine. 
<laughs> well, she's you know, also a demon, so we'll see when that fucking comes into play. You keep, you keep I'm, to your. I'm on to the sin eater. All you right, keep your secrets. She's, <laughs> she's, she's going sideways. She's got a perverted deal with somebody. She's got ulterior motives. It's a family practice. She's the last of her of her lineage that uh, practices this this culture. It has nothing to do with some type of, you know. Devil's Crossroads agreement with fucking Mephisto. <laughs> I, I understand. I'm picking up all the words you're putting at me. I'm just not. You're disagreeing entirely. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on the same page. <laughs> when I said that I lack consistency as like a main character trait of my person, I would say being a fucking troll is like <laughs> is being a, is a main character trait of Django Phillips is one of my strengths yeah he will shoot in the dark for yeah. whatever possible yeah. outcome he can wrap his tiny fingers on <laughs> oh my god <laughs> It was metaphorically. Holy shit. You yeah. have nice long veiny fingers. I do actually have very long slender fingers. You do. I have I have grubby little well, no. little pudgers, little little sausages. But I just have a long lanky body. <coughs> oh. Yeah, man. Anyway. Envy. Yeah, so uh we did <coughs> we did lust and we did greed. And now we're into envy. Envy. And um Yeah, I mean what is envy but lust and greed combined? If you really think about it. Whoa. A poof. Just had a mind explosion when you said that. I mean, no, I mean, that's not... I'm not trying to be <laughs> Holy subversive. Holy shit! I'm trying to say, like, really, all of the sins are so alike each other that really anyone can apply to any spoke of the wheel at any they, well, point in time. Funny you should say that. They say pride is the ultimate sin. All others are derived from. The, the I think pride is the ultimate sin because of shit like the Catholic Church, you know, like where they essentially say that people need to act a certain way their entire lives. And if they don't, you know, fuck you. Right. I don't, I don't actually believe that pride is that bad of a sin. I mean, do people deserve to go to hell for thinking they're hot shit? No. Do people deserve to go to hell if they think they're such hot shit that they lead to a global holocaust? Like... Adolf Hitler. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, like, right. there is a fine line. <laughs> there's, a, there's a limit. Yeah. <laughs> there's a fine line yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I feel like almost all of the other ones are, are so much worse than pride. Why do you think pride is like... I don't think pride personally oh, is, okay. but I'm, I, I agree with you in terms of that whole Catholic outlook. Like, I, I guess people that are, are guilty of pride are broken upon the wheel and the other sins get you lashed to it. So it's kind of like the the er uh, sin. It's the uh, <laughs> it's the peer pressure drug that turns you into a full out drug addict. <laughs> In, into a lustful, greedful, slothful. It is gluttonous. the uh, it's the blunt that you're like. Uh, that kid you know in British literature that you shared one class in high school with. Right. He just sh gives you a blunt at a party one day, and all of a sudden you're hanging out with him every week. And yep. very, very uh, disquietly, four years later, you find out he died from, like, a meth overdose. Yeah. That <laughs> sounded... That, yeah, that sounded very general and not at all specific. And not at all specific. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think it's... Uh, I think it's interesting, and, and I love the idea of sins, the idea of, like, someone somewhere thought this shit was so bad that if you did any of it, you're just automatically going to hell. Like, right. how metal is that? But at the same time, like, how how Aesop's Fables is this shit? How, like, basic oh, super is basic. this shit? Because yeah. it's, like, it's like greed, like, want for not. Like, that is, right. that is your right. alternative. Like... Well, no, everyone's going to want something. It's, it's, we're human. You know, we, 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 we see what other people have. We, we want what other people experience. Right. You know, envy is like probably one of the most believable sins of all time. Uh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> TikTok is full of envious TikTokers. people. One person does one fucking thing and a million people imitate it. And, and this is kind of off topic. <laughs> The sins are lazy. Like, is not is gluttony just not food greed? 
Like what? How? It how is food out grade. of ideas were but they? But that's what I mean. They were like, okay, we have these six deadly sins, and then they came back and they were like, oh no, actually, we need seven. Lust is sex greed. Right. <laughs> like, like yeah, yeah. No. No. Essentially, essentially, all of these sins are so inherently human that like to live your life void of all of them is, I would say, impossible. You'd have to be a sin eater. Or none. Well. Y- well. Anyway. Um, chapter three. <coughs> chapter three is called... <laughs> you always laugh when I, when I fucking cough. <laughs> I just I laugh when we both make weird sounds. And oh, okay. Continue on. Yeah. Yeah. It's because it's because sometimes if I find them funny enough, I keep them on I, the show. I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how much you've listened to this program. I but, have, uh, but, but I think I keep every burp I've ever done. I'm at episode four, <laughs> so I'm trying to get caught up. What's funny is I'm pretty sure that's your episode. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't get through it, dude. It's just so long, dude. I'm I co-host is an you asshole. Know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think loser. I think the f- <laughs> the funniest thing about your your oldest episodes is how dearly I miss like certain things that we used to cover mm. like search and rescue stories like I miss them so much and like I know the guy has gone on to write like more in the same vein right like apparently he's putting together like a a search and rescue stories like book that's like not only told in chronological chronological order, but like cataloged from the same perspective. So it's like one guy telling a story as things get worse okay. in a situation. Um, but like, oh man, that 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 concept came up at work the other day. I literally was sitting working, and my coworkers behind me were having a conversation, and the girl was talking about like Jetlov Pass. And, um, you know, mysterious instances, um, happening in the wilderness and shit. Sure. I think there was a, there was a recent catastrophe of some kind that she was, you know, initially talking about that, that she got taken off track about, but she literally stopped at one point and I'm not making this up and literally said, and have you heard this thing about stairs in the woods? (laughs) And I literally stopped what I was doing swiveled my chair around and says you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you about stairs in the woods stairs in the woods right <laughs> but like she she has never listened to my show before no one at like people at work know I have a podcast but I refuse to share it with any of them because of the type of shit I say on sure. here um the 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 funniest thing was I turned around and I just like started like citing all of these like things and I and I sent her the link to to the guy's story series and I was like I was like if you if you thought of that or if you heard of that and thought it was like a real thing like that's that's both hilarious and great but please um you know read these stories and let me know how you feel about them. And I felt like for the first time in, in like years, someone like peddling my wares and being like, Oh, you want to talk about something spooky now? Sowing your seeds. You want to talk about something spooky now? Like <laughs> stairs in the woods. Are you talking about stairs? I'll get that started. My boy's got stairs. <laughs> you talking about stairs? You talking about stairs here? Are we talking it's about stairs? It's funny because it happened that way. Um, but uh, my, my stepbrother, uh, come was there so he can vouch for it. But, um, yeah, I think I think this show has your stepbrother come. My stepbrother come. What? My stepbrother on the show. His name is Come. Oh my! Oh, I forgot about the whole aliases thing for a second. I was like, dude, I know nothing about your life. <laughs> <laughs> you have a stepbrother. Named yeah, come? my stepdad has a really interesting sense of humor. He literally just named his kid Spunk. <laughs> he was just like, I don't know what this is. It's I. It came out. This of is me, my I cum. Guess. This is my cum. <laughs> this is cum. Meet my son, cum. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. It's like we literally uh. just spent a weekend with him, and you thought his name was, <laughs> and you thought his name was no, cum. No, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about him. I was thinking you, you had a some, different, some random, other some some rando stuff. other that's, of your that's, seven seven other stepbrothers. That's that's. Hilarious, and I'm gonna hold on to that. Yeah, I'm gonna let him know. Yeah, (laughs) 
Um, but yeah, uh, we're we're gonna jump into some uh, fucking Sin Eater, and I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the first episode. I hope everyone enjoys this one because we got fucking more to do after this point. And if you don't like it, go fuck yourself. Uh, this part three is called Envy Eats Nothing But Its Own Heart. Bad apostrophe. Yes. Uh, more to the point, what do you think it means by that? Envy eats nothing but its own heart. Um, I think it's like... It you know, hurts a person more to, yeah. to want for these things you, than to actually get them. Yes, if you if you are consumed by envy, mm. you will attain nothing that you envy except ah. your own destruction. That's some Confucius-like shit right there. Oh, boy. Do you want to start reading as the narrator, or do you want me to start reading as the narrator? I'll do it! Jump into it. To say it's been a rough 48 hours would be a gross understatement. Gross needs to be, like, bolded and underlined. Gross understatement. Because... Be Not a net understatement. And, and she does say in the next sentence. And I do mean gross. <laughs> yes, thank you. Because um, if we didn't point it out, both of the things that happened in part one and part two were yep. fucking she's not, obscene. She's not a sin absorber. <laughs> she's not a sin listener. See, that's not even the part that I'm talking about. I'm oh. talking about, like, the cannibalist. And I'm sure. talking about, like, the patches of human skin. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. You're talking about the eating part. I mean, she eats the sin. Are she you vegan? <laughs> Am I vegan at this moment? No. Are you not? No, I'm not vegan. You're not vegan? No, because I'm because I'm too lazy and I hate throwing away food. So uh, the option is always for me to be vegan or to not throw away food. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to throw away food. What meat you been consuming lately? Just the flesh of people. Just uh, people. Just I'm just people. trying to get into people real big. People. Yeah. It's a lot of preparation. Yeah, it's people. a lot. It's a... Taste, um, maybe not worth it. Taste not worth it. <laughs> but the whole experience, 10 out of 10. Waste for not, want for not. <laughs> My body did not react to the food very well, and as I stared down at the now empty bowl, my world grew hazy and my body became limp as toxic shock overcame me. For a while, I simply floated in the Stygian void between worlds. I saw very little save for flashes of bioluminescent colors, beautiful patterns that raced past my eyes and bore into my skull pushing the endorphins out to my aching limbs. I could hear voices off in the distance, but I was so high above it all that it mattered very little. All right, Maroon 5. As I concentrated, shapes would coalesce and form out of the dredges of darkness. Bountiful planets, beauteous stars, and stellar galaxies that appeared far closer than they actually were, each individual strand of its great cosmic arms winking at me in Morse code. A greeting? No, a warning. S-O-S. S-O-S. Something else formed on the fringe of my peripheral vision. A vacuous black hole with an event horizon that spanned the stretch of my view. It was a bright orange hue with a thick, pungent red that pulsated as the hole grew larger, devouring anything that came near it with great expediency. Wow. Then out of its murky depths, a long arm punctured the blackness, colossal and pulling itself free as a body began to emerge. The same specter that's plagued me since I got on the plane here. Ah. It unhinged its jaws and began biting down on a nearby planet, ripping it to pieces with razor teeth and straining its teeth as if the planet were a ripe fruit. Stretching out its gnarled fingers once more, it clenched a fist around the planet, holding up five fingers with a free hand. The other firmly shut on the crumbled planet as it cackled in such a wicked way that it snapped me from my sleep. Five. It's it's super interesting that I forgot about this like fucking thing that's been following her, counting down um, to the seven sins yeah. that she has to consume. Uh, part of me thinks it's some sort of like death knell. It's some type of death, um, you know, a, a, a harbinger. Right. Something something that is more to the point alluding that this act is going to leave her worse off than she initially imagined and and we just graduated just now from like persistent nightmare to planet eater which i feel like that's oh a yeah big we step. went from i saw this guy in the background of my dream and right. he said a stupid number and disappeared 
to I just watched this guy Eat consume Jupiter. what is the idea of life. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's something very cosmically dreadful up about in the, that. Up in the stakes here. The first thing I felt when I awoke was a pounding sensation in my head, mainly because as, as I snapped awake and stood up, my skull collided with the wardens in a sickening thud. <laughs> Ach! Mein Gott, woman! I was just inspecting you to ensure that there was no lasting damage. He stumbled back, clutching his forehead as I did my own. Nestor rushed in, rushed in and looked ready for a fight before seeing the state we were in. Nell! You good? You've been out for a day and a half. We were getting worried. Warden here said he'd have to pull the plug if you didn't get up soon. The warden shifted uncomfortably before looking over at me, his lips curling into half a smile as he shrugged playfully. What matters now, mine Fraulein, is that you're awake and ready for your next sin. Amorosa was a unique challenge, but one I was confident you would overcome, even if the food was regrettable. He shivered as our minds were cast back to the plate of meat. Cartwright family meat. Not your fault. Nobody knows what the food will be until it happens. But no more games from this point on, okay? Not your fault. Nobody knows what the food will be until it happens, but no more games from this point on, okay? I want to know what I'm dealing with when I walk in there, especially after this latest scare. I do find it interesting that he, like, made her go blindly into this shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, he was testing her, but... Also, the first words out of your mouth, I hope, and mine also, would not be, not your fault... It'd be, It'd hey, be maybe fuck you. Hey, maybe you fucking tell me what I'm Hey, maybe for. fucking let's take a breath here. These people are, are demons. Damn, dude. <laughs> she's so cool with this. <laughs> maybe she's used to it. it maybe well, there's something casual about this. Yeah. Like, like, I've been here before. Everyone's always fucking like I this. I think in a way that's probably true. I stood up and walked towards him, a finger outstretched in an accusatory manner, trying my best to be intimidating against a tall man whose name literally translated to Corpse Mountain. Am I clear? For a split second, I thought he would do something drastic. Maybe strike me where I sp stood or spit in my face. The expression on his face was nothing short of utter incredulity that someone spoke to him this way. But in an instant, it snapped to the wild eccentricity he'd shown throughout, and he nodded exuberantly. Yeah, yeah, I think you proved you can handle it. Very well. Our next inmate is prisoner number 2122, Ethan Elliot Blasnick III, a 22-year-old programmer who committed a series of kidnappings and torture killings on young men and women in the Washington area. His sin is his own to tell you, but I should caution you. This man will use his information against you and try to get a rise out of you. Why? <coughs> I cannot say. He has made comments about you in his request. I suspect he has reasons for you being here beyond the request. The warden went for the door, informing us we had four hours to prep and we'd be collected at the appropriate time. Glancing around the room for anything non-meat related, my eyes stumbled over the open compendium. It sat on a photo of Buck and his entire family. He was younger, his famous beard little more than a stubble on his chiseled jaw as a man barely in his 20s, sporting a more conservative explorer's outfit than the one he proudly wears now. Around his sides are two elder brothers, Darius and Johnny, his sister Tara, cousins Porter, Solomon, and Brandon. His father Nathaniel stood proudly by him, huge hands resting gently on his shoulders, and his wife, Buck's mother, uh, Sersha, <laughs> Buck's mother, Sersha, Lovingly nestled in his chest, you think you get me with that spelling? You don't get me with I, that spelling. I lost it. Is that really how that's pronounced? Yeah, it, only because the actress, Shurs right. Saoirse Ronan. Yeah. Lovingly nest nestled in his chest, beaming down at her boy. In front of them all, on this proud occasion, was the hunting trophy that Buck had claimed as a rite of passage. He'd successfully taken down a wayward lycanthrope with nothing but his wit and a bowie knife. And then he got a kill streak. Buck hated killing anything without cause, but this was one creature he couldn't ignore even then. 
It had been devouring children who ventured too far from the safety of the village and venturing into forest territory where this intelligent killer would wait. They say when Buck sliced the stomach open, two children spilled out. Neither alive, sadly. Hmm. It was even here that Buck got his nickname, holding onto the beast as it thrashed around and tried desperately to free itself from his grip, bucking him around as he drove the knife into his ears and eyes repeatedly. Simon would forever cease to be his name henceforth. Buck Nasty McGraw was <laughs> born on that day. Buck Nasty. Hot damn. <laughs> I smiled, the photo bringing such warmth and comfort after a physically exhausting few days, tracing my hands over it and remembering the good times where we first met. Hard to believe it was ten years ago already, ain't it? Buck called, passing me a hot drink and sitting next to me as I observed the photo with wistful eyes. I met you on the very first job I took as a licensed crypto hunter and cataloger. You were still in training then with your grandparents. It must have been a few days shy of sixteen when you assisted me in taking down that elusive forest god. You talked to him for what felt like hours to get his sin while I tried to subdue him. And then he reared back, bleated and ran headfirst into a tree, knocking you both out cold. Yes, I remember. I chuckled, his eyes rolling at the mere mention of his failure as he too began laughing. How was I to know that he was more goat than God? Still, that was the day I was given one of the most important laugh lessons I'd carry on to our working relationship all these years later. I looked to the note left at the bottom of the photo, the one that Buck coveted like it was the most valuable piece of treasure he'd ever own or would own. Son. Oh, this is his dad. <laughs> yes. Right, well, son. <laughs> Today you are my equal. Tomorrow you will surpass that. The compendium is now your responsibility and your job to fill. But promise me, son, you won't forget the family and will embody our most important trait. Make as many connections along the way as you can, for our time is fleeting and all cycles must one day repeat. With all the love in the world, day it. I, I love how rich these characters' worlds are, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we know close to nothing about them. Mm -hmm. We know we are learning things about them, and the things we are learning are fantastical and just erroneous yeah. <laughs> in nature. It shows a lot of restraint, too, to keep the exposition to the third chapter. Like, all this... Oh, oh yeah, we knew we knew he had a book, we knew he was writing in a right. book, and we knew he was writing about weird shit. Um, we didn't quite know yeah. the rest of that baggage. What lesson might that be, Buck? I asked, smiling as he took my hands into his, and those hazel eyes shone with pride and admiration. That nail Lockwood is stronger than I could ever hope to be, and if she can talk a forest god into stupidity, she can beat any sinner or monstrosity this world has to throw at her. And I will support her every goddamn step of the way. I did it when we hit the Coma City, I did it when we dealt with the Dreamwalker, and I will do it until my dying breath. I felt weak, partially from the sentiment and from the lack of actual food over a day and a half. I nodded affirmatively, and he patted my hands before fixing me something to eat after hearing my stomach groan in protest. We're also here, you know, if you need anything fucking up. That's kind of our whole modus operandi. Rip and tear! Rip and tear! Edgar chimed in, mocking Nestor's... Stop it! ...as he tried to <laughs> silence him, bringing an even bigger smile to my face. In spite of where I was and how I felt, I was truly blessed. Even if the image of that fucking creature in my dream still loomed on the edges of my vision. <laughs> even now. Yeah. When the announcement rang out for us to go towards the visitation area, there was a sense of concern amongst all of us that we were going to reach a critical mass point that we would be completely and utterly unable to bounce back from. We haven't already gotten there? No. Still, we can easily turn back, of course. <laughs> I know in my case the pervasive question that lingered in my mind was simple. How many of these sins could I take before they began to consume every good part of me? Hey, there you go. It's literally what you've been saying. I kept close to the others and tried to keep my mind focused on the job at hand, not the mounting list of concerns I had about this facility, the inhabitants, or my own competency. As we passed the gate, I heard soft music coming from the interview room. Is that normal? I asked the guard. He didn't look at me once, keeping his gaze firmly on the door handle as he scanned his ID card and waited for the green light. For most, no. But for the death row inmates, yes. Some you've seen already don't care for furnishing these little spaces, but Blaznik and the others do. 
If the music is ever too loud, just get Holden to come out and we'll instruct him to turn it down. Oh, and, um, try to keep calm in there. Uh, he has a habit of riling people up. The machine beeped, and the door swung open to let loose the hard EDM blasting from the inmate's side. It was Derude. <laughs> Strobe lighting beamed across the room, and a young man, short in stature and muscular on the top half of their frame, the bottom half remarkably skinny and without definition. He was throwing his entire weight behind his arms as he danced around the room, smashing anything in his wake and frequently hitting the same spot on the wall with extreme ferocity, knuckles bashing into concrete as he screeched at the top of his lungs. Oh my god. Something meshed in with the wall, blood and skin on his knuckles as he pulled away, breathing heavily as the song came to an end. It was a photo of someone. The image faded and crumpled, but the smile of a charming young woman in her late teens, early twenties, still shining through. You're Ethan, right? I'm... N Before I could finish, he held up a bloody knuckle and extended his index finger towards me, wagging it as we took our seats. No, that's not how this works, my dear. You will address me by my full title, and only then will I respond. He breathed in, hunching his shoulders and flexing. Oh, bitches really think they're so entitled, don't they? I felt anger surge through me. I didn't take to insults or a lack of respect at the best of times, but I knew better than to let advice given to me just moments ago fly out the window. I pulled up my chair and closed my eyes for a moment before responding. My apologies. Mr. Ethan Elliot Blasnick III. My name is Miss Nell Lockwood. My associates are... Again, he wagged his finger as he pulled a beanbag, undamaged from the tantrum moments ago, and sank into it, legs spread out and attempting to keep his bulge within his sweatpants visible at all times as he spoke again, arrogance oozing from him. Don't care. They're just other dudes. I'm not interested. I, I pinched my nose. This is going to be a long, long session. Mr. Blasnick, what was your intent with calling me here? I assume you have more to say than just hurling insults. I was made to understand you had a sin to confess. He shifted and scratched his crotch as he spat on the floor. Mm. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. You know, you'd be a lot harder if you dropped the pretense that you're intelligent or in any way authoritative. Women are far more desirable when they're just silent or agreeable. Instead of responding, I decided to simply write down some notes onto my ledger, making the occasional glance up before passing them over to Buck and Nestor to observe. Why are you ignoring me? He leaned forward and let his jaw go slack, hands hanging over his thighs. I continued to pass nonsensical notes with comments like smile and chuckle while glancing up at him briefly. It only took three minutes to fly into a rage, picking up a piece of furniture from his makeshift room and hurling it at the plexiglass with a thunderous boom. You think you're better than me, you fucking skank? Why? Because you're pretty? Because you're smart? Bitch, I have an IQ of 186. I lift weights for this sculpted body and I can have anyone do anything. I don't need you. Get the fuck out of my sight now! He boomed, spit flying from his mouth as he finished, face beetroot red and huffing in place. Sounds good. <laughs> we can go out, live our lives, and do great things. Plus, it seems your sin isn't worth eating anyway. Uh, the inmates across the way have far more delectable sins. I walked to the door and held onto the handle. It was easy to ascertain this poor boy's sin. His face may have been red with anger, but his sin was green with envy. And I intend to play him like a fiddle. What? Wait. My sin is worthy. Just... Just listen, and I'll tell you. I'm sorry, madame. I'm so sorry. He trembled getting down to his knees and clasping his hands together as if he were a pitiful anime character. <laughs> oh, senpai. <laughs> Please, forgive my transgressions. You're, you're a queen. 
I should have controlled myself better. It was pathetic, but not entirely surprising for a manipulator. I took my hand off the door and sat back down. Edgar Kong as Holden apologized for waking him up just to move. Sad boy! Sad boy! He chirped, Holden throwing him a piece of meat to placate him. I saw Ethan's eyebrow twitch, but he didn't break his stance until I was fully seated. Your file says you're a remarkable programmer, former member of the White Hats, efficient at taking down any rival who opposed you, and with a 4.0 GPA in school and a scholarship to whatever university you want. You came from privilege and were intent on pursuing a promising career. So what the hell happened to you? Buck let the paper fall down, flat in disbelief as he stroked his beard. Ethan looked him up and down and put his hand into his patchy bearded face, anger rushing over him until I interjected. Ethan, honey, keep your focus on me. Buck is my friend and just like Nestor over there, he's here to help. Can you do that? I was never an expert at charming people, but I put on my sweetest tone and most sincere smile, which seemed to work. He relaxed and let out a side grin. Of course, Mr. Simon McGraw of the fabled McGraw clan of cryptozoologists isn't the least bit threatening anyway. Even if his beard is better than mine, I'll get my own eventually, bigger and better than yours, and I bet I know way more about monsters than he does. Seen enough of them in my time. He grumbled, fumbling with his hands. So many fucking animals on the internet that make me look tame by proxy. What have you seen, Ethan? What turns you into the person you are today? I asked gently, a plate to hand and a mind open to adverse reactions. Let's start with social media. It's a toxic, vacuous black hole from which nothing can escape. You see something, you take a photo and you post it, showing it off to all your adoring fans. Shit, they can never even afford or hope to have for themselves. From money to bitch women and everything in between. It's posturing and it's sick. He snorted and averted his eyes from mine. So many friends getting married, having kids, successful jobs, shit. I could never dream of it. <clears throat> it wasn't fair. It isn't fair. But that's not the worst of it. Go on. We're listening. I tap my fingers rhythmically on the table, hoping this wasn't going to turn my stomach. You see, you can get all sorts of shit on the dark web. Anything, really. And I made some good friends there, though they were my brothers in arms. Thought they understood what I was going through. The group I was closest to was the Terrapin System. A group of like-minded young men dedicated to routing out problematic individuals, proud thought patrollers. We were so good at what we did. Okay, wouldn't you call it the Thought Police? Mm. Isn't that way better than Thought Patrollers? Thought... The Thought Police. Thought... Thought... Thought Police. I don't know, Thought Patrollers goes more with the accent. Well... <laughs> <laughs> That's true, he is Scotch. It's true. I'm doing I'm doing like a Jason Statham. Oh, oh, you're in, okay. I don't know. Listen. <laughs> Scottish. I'm not If I was doing Scottish Yeah, that's true. That's, prior thought to patrol us. That's my bad identification. It's not your bad selling it. <laughs> I've been watch I watched all of the Fast and the Furious movies over the last weekend. <laughs> so you're in it. So I'm in you're it. You're locked in. I am Jason Statham. Sorry, thought patrollers? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand why I someone didn't go with thought, thought police. police. <laughs> I interjected. Sure, it was a derogatory <laughs> slur of some kind. Say you date a girl and she's had multiple partners, maybe a dozen or so. Think of it like a shoe, okay? Why would I, a clear alpha, want to buy a shoe that's been used and stretched as opposed to a fresh shoe never worn before? That is what the Thought Patrol is all about. Finding these disgusting women and shaming them. But we didn't stop there. We'd harass them, stalk them, ensure they never got to feel safe until they publicly apologized and renounced their evil ways. He stopped, and a wide grin ran across his face, eyes alight with passion. It was such a beautiful time. 
until the incident. He got up and walked towards a whiteboard, obscured in the background, tracing his fingers across it before wheeling it over to us. It was full of photos, some appropriate model shots, and others far less pleasant. Side glances of someone as they walked to their home, unassuming shots of someone sleeping, showering, or eating. My skin crawled and my breath shortened. I knew this kind of horrific behavior all too well, this level of obsession that would send any sane woman running to a police station if she knew. Every photo was the same young woman. Damn. I met Siren Sarah 2213 on a stream one night while I was bored. She was different to the others. Her stream was barely populated and she was going on some tangent about female purity, being unfair to men and being nicer to everyone, but man, she looked sexy as hell in a cosplay outfit. I just felt this instant connection and reached out to her, donating to her stream so she'd notice me. Wherever she'd say my name and ask me something, I felt validated. He looked at us, his head tilted to the side with a vacant look in his eyes. Do you know what it's like for someone to look at you and see you, Miss Lockwood? I mean, since your mother, of course. I felt a sharp, stabbing sensation rush through my stomach, but I didn't want to stop his flow, so I simply nodded and motioned for him to continue. I ended up spending nearly $3,000 on her. By the time the final donation went out, she was doing one-on-one -on -one streams with me and giving me life advice, saying that my methods with the Terrapins weren't strong enough, that they weren't who they said they were. She pushed me to dig into them, and when I finally did, she was right. Most of them had families, friends, partners, and even kids. They had fucking kids! How could they understand our methods if they were with their loving partners? He bellowed, tears in his eyes. I found their secret chat where they mocked me, called me a kissless virgin and the king of the incels, hundreds of memes about me with my body photoshopped onto unflattering edits, uh, doggy memes directly ripping into my personal views and experiences it was damaging when I told Siren about it she soothed me to sleep and promised to show me how to get revenge that I would be the purest knight this world has ever seen with her by my side she even said that we could be together when my job was completed can you believe that I was so lucky but at the same time I, I knew it was right I am an alpha male, and nothing would change that. There was a pause as he looked closely over at Nestor, half cradling Edgar as he ate quietly and his body language still tensed up in case of a fight. Ethan's smile faded, and he walked over to the far side of the glass, sizing Nestor up. Hey, Holden. You Jewish? He asked, disgust in his voice. Holden's eyes flashed, but he kept his cool. What if I am? He asked, his hand still softly petting Edgar. Ethan shook his head. Pity. It's a waste of good muscle. He spat again and walked back over to Nell. It's all bullshit anyway, Mr. Blasnick. At least in my line of work, everyone ends up in the same place. No matter what god, goddess, or demon you pray to. It ain't worth shit when you're in front of Lady Death. Ethan exploded at this, the double standards beginning to shine through. My religion is pure. It's the truest path through God and Jesus. And I heard about your line of work. Total fucking fake news. You think I'd buy for a second your work with for Lady Death? Fuck off! If Death is a woman, she's the biggest thought going, stupid cunt. He was beginning to fly into a rage again, not wishing to breach both his racist views and the depths of their religious ideologies. I stepped in to keep him focused. <laughs> Ethan, your sin. What did Siren tell you to do next? I was sensing a pattern in these encounters. Ethan took a breath and sank back into his beanbag. She began appearing in my dreams, which was weird. But she gave me remarkable instructions and tools to take them down one by one. Addresses for their homes, names of their loved ones, methods to enact my revenge. 
And it's at this point you begin your crusade against injustice, correct? Buck asked. Ethan refused to look at him as he nodded in my direction. I began with a test run on the newest member. <clears throat> he was easy to locate since he never deviated from his pattern. He'd never seen me in person, so when I posed as a Mormon looking to give him some info on the book of Joseph Smith, he never batted an eyelid with him being one himself. The guy even invited me into his home. Big mistake. The second his door locked, I smashed his brains in with a claw hammer. It was then that Siren spoke to me again. He looked wistfully up at the ceiling, pausing before continuing. Was he ashamed, or was he reveling in the moment? She said, They took everything from you. Now take something you wanted from them. So I looked at this fallen piece of meat. Daryl, I think his name was. I looked at him and asked myself what I wanted most. Well, Daryl had a beautiful home, despite his new status to the group. So I took that. Easy enough to move in and assume his bills. The guy was a shut-in, and nobody questioned it when I took over. A thick green mist was now covering the surrounding floor. It almost looked like noxious, but Ethan paid it no mind. How did she talk to you? I asked, his attention lasting and almost looking offended I'd stopped him mid-flow. What? Why does that matter? She was there when I needed her. As she always was. He retorted bile in his words. It matters to me. I can't eat your sin if I don't know everything. You wouldn't want to lie to me, would you? I'm not as clever as I look. I felt disgust at my own depreciation, but this was part of the job, so I st stuck with it. His expression softened and he carried on. Fine, fine. I can't excuse a lady being honest. Siren wasn't a normal girl. She was radiant, alluring, and always there when I needed her. I mean, I mean that literally. After I donated to her enough, the one-on-one -on -one sessions began and she manifested in front of me. I could never touch her, but I could always see her as clear as I see you. She was instrumental in my growth, and as we proceeded, she only got clearer to me. After a couple more targets, I'd taken their car, bank accounts, but the last one was where things got complicated. He paused again, and I exchanged a look with Buck. I didn't like where this was going. The haze was beginning to form the shape of a woman, a bowl. See, Siren told me not to listen to anything they said, to keep my mind focused on what they had that I didn't. That this would be one of the final steps to ascension. She gave me something to drink, and for a moment our fingers brushed. I felt electricity run through us. So I did as I was told. I drank from the bowl and ignored everything until I reached the master bedroom. I felt different. My vision was tunneled, and a green haze fell over my eyes as my fists acted on their own. My claw hammer was tossed aside as I strangled the person in front of me, seeing visions of the life they led that I was denied. The laughter of all my colleagues in the group, happy couples, an entire fucking world at my expense, all of them just filling up in my skull until it threatened to burst like the stupid cunts in front of me as my grip grew tighter and tighter until he stopped motioning the bursting of balloon and contents spilling out no more i felt as if i'd constricted them into submission became the true alpha now the leader of the pack but no instead i was looking down at a total stranger a woman in fact you were Looking down at the woman you've been thirsting for all this time, weren't you, Blaznik? Buck sighed, venom in his words. Sersha Maisie Lovewood, 19-year-old streamer and model. You'd been paying to get her attention, and one night you flew into a rampage when she banned you from the server. You got her info, and that of your contemporaries when they tried to stop you. He held up a photo as the mist began forming, the two matching up perfectly. 
a beautiful woman with flowing red hair, the photo showing a cosplay of Poison Ivy from the Batman comics. The woman now formed in the room with him clad in an emerald green dress that hung at the shoulder, clutching a large bowl with a bubbling liquid. No, that's... that's not... I, I, I don't... Sersha Indiviosa, Buck said, getting up to slam the photo against the wall and making him look as her counterpart walked towards him. Sersha, abounding in envy. Never had a siren call into you, Blaznik. Never had a larger than life plan fit for an alpha mastermind. Your jealousy simply overwhelmed you, created a narrative where you were in control and had it all. Well, you're going to live out your sin whether you want to or not. You will spend your final moments knowing you can never have what you want. I looked at my own plate and saw two dishes form. One was a side of Mexican bean and rice with green peppers. The other was a Glamorgan. The other was a Glamorgan? I was fine with Glamorgan. The other was a Glamorgan sausage and Yorkshire pudding, the way my mom made it. The exact way she made it, even smelling as such. I felt an overwhelming rush of emotions and nostalgic memories, desperately fighting to come to the surface with the first bite. But I couldn't reach for it, even if I wanted to. Eyes fixated on the enfolding carnage in front of me, my body acted on its own and began shoveling the rice into my mouth as the sausage in Yorkshire faded from view, lovingly being consumed by something unseen. Mm. I watched with anger and misery as the meal I wanted was once again fading from my grasp. After a few moments of staring, Ethan turned to see the visage of a siren in front of him. Her expression that of pure satisfaction as she used her free hand to point down on the floor in a domineering fashion. He whimpered and obliged, head pressed against the ground as he shook. I only wanted what was mine. Isn't that fair? Isn't that a man's right to claim what is rightfully his? I don't understand. Is this ascension of punishment? I, I don't. I don't. He rose his head up to look at the visage of Sersha as she tipped the contents of the bowl over him and into his mouth, partially widened in a scream that would never be uttered. The green liquid ate at his skin with remarkable speed, flesh bubbling and popping as it splattered across the pexiglass, his rapidly decaying torso shuddering and eyes melting into the sockets as he gurgled until slumping over. But I was less focused on his pain and more so on my own. This sin did not physically encumber me, make me sick, or wear me out. No, instead it bore into my soul and found a small place to nest next to the memories of my mother that I kept with me every day. It managed to shake my professionalism and my confidence, something nobody had done before. With more of these fucking monsters to go, I was unsure I was up for the task and began to doubt my abilities. As if on cue, the same spectral night terror that had plagued me since my arrival shone in the viscera of the plexiglass standing right behind me with a malformed digit up to its cracked lips in a hush motion. In its other hand, it held the totem I'd been given by Nestor as safekeeping, from God knows what. I watched as this thing crushed it to dust, holding up a number as a shockwave ran throughout my body, fear buckling my knees and something in the prison stirring at my presence, something I would come to fear more than any other creature in existence. Four. Shit! Inmate 2122, Ethan, Elliot, Blasnik, third, Sin, Envy, Food, Mexican Bean is that rice, and the one dish I will always want, but will never have again. Because her mom's not around to make Because her mom's dead. Her. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed the metaphor a lot. She reaches for the dish she wanted, and the Mexican beans and rice are forced into her mouth as she watches the dish slowly disappear into shadows. The it's only like, thing fuck. I can think for that whole passage is like, damn, I want those beans and rice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's funny that the, the voice I chose to do made sense to like the dialogue that the character had. Mm -hmm. He said things very funnily, like... He used the word patrollers instead of police. Right. He used the word cunt. What is it? European type European, of thing to say, like yeah. Australian. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, um, I'm just glad that that didn't. Uh, if, if I were to go back and read it over again, I'd probably just read it as meekly as I could. Um, but I wanted to have fun with it, so that that felt fun. It worked. Um, it worked with the Jason Statham. I, <laughs> the the oh, Jason like Statham. The Jason. Um, yeah, so that's a fun one. Um, um, my, my question is, is all of this stuff, like, literally happening? Did, did he just die in front of them? Yes. Huh. 
He did. He did literally die in the prison. Mm-mm. Why? Like, like, why would the warden want this? Or no, I'm asking why these demons keep manifesting into reality and doing weird shit. Well, it's it's two ideas, right? It's either the comeuppance of the naive person who lusts for power that makes a pact with a demon doesn't really understand the what will happen. Oh, no, I understand the right. process. I want to know why it's physically happening. Why it's happening like there. <clears throat> in in the prison. I don't know. I mean, it, obviously it has something to do with her. Does it? For sure. They they've been in this prison That's for That's true. They they months, kind of whatever. They kind of uh physically come to being when they're in the throes of telling someone right. recounting um, this. Yeah, recounting their their sin, the the act of the sin. Yeah. Um very specifically to this person. Right. Um but I'm sure they've had to do this song and dance to detectives and police and shit beforehand, so was it was it not passionate enough the first time they did it? They had to go to the middle of the Bermuda Triangle to some random little prison to talk to the sin eater for the actual sin to to no, take I th- physical form. That's what I'm saying. I think they've even, yeah. they've recounted this and you they've think thought this, about it. The 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 stars have aligned. I think with her it's different. Her her presence makes it different. I think that's fair. Um anyway, we're moving on to uh, the next sin, which is a, a fun one. I'm, I, I, I would probably say this is uh, this is one I am a big fan of. Um, That's a good sin. Sloth, yeah, good sin. sloth is a is a fun sin because um, what is it? It's not it's not quite depressed. It's not quite lazy. It's a combination of the two. I just know sloth has laziness. If it if it has more nuance than that, I don't know about it. I feel like sloth has. Uh, is laziness a sin? Well, none of okay. Listen, none of these are sins. In I, I mean, yeah. In an abstract sense, sloth <laughs> is not a sin. But you know, you know, it's just funny to think about that people thought these were good ideas. Um. You know, so so long ago, right? In in religion, and, and some of them make sense. Like like sloth makes sense, gluttony kind of makes sense, but like you said, like why identify pride? Why why pen that like pride is such a sin? I think it goes Wait, to like why is sloth a sin? Well, sloth makes sense. So if you're if you're creating this Actually, religious, I just, I just kind of said it in my head. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Sloth. Sloth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. that's my album. Maybe <laughs> the idea that like, if you do nothing with your life, you're a fucking waste. Right, and sin, <laughs> and in our society that is fine, but in a in a like, two thousand two hundred two yeah two thousand year ago society yeah where survival's not guaranteed, you can't really have too many people. To be, to be sloth is to to accept death. Yeah. In some way, shape, or form. That's interesting to think about. Uh, through sloth comes the greatest tragedies. Panic and uh, Disco. Part four. Great. Yes. Very. Uh, oh. Yeah, I can see that one. Um, I think I get that as an idea. Through sloth comes the greatest tragedies. Um, but by not acting, you allow bad shit to manifest the greatest of tragedies yeah maybe you you shoot you you go for a sandwich in germany one day and the fucking prime minister of bullshit comes rolling down the street and you just so happen to hate this guy enough to pull out your gun and fucking shoot him boom um yeah world war one World War One. i'm glad i'm glad you figured that out there you go (laughs) anyway um yeah if you're just joining us, my name is Nell Lockwood. I'm the last sin eater, and I'm about to meet my next inmate, a person steeped in negligence, self righteousness, and laziness. We're just gonna pretend the last guy didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Are we just moving like we accept it as this a fucking episode of Seinfeld? Well, if you're it just, just joining fucking, us, it just fucking opens. Bing, bing, ding, 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 ding. I'm Nell Lockwood. And, uh, and I'm bears. here to. <laughs> no, it's Jackass. Bing, 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 bing. Hi, I'm Nell Lockwood, and I'm here to eat the next sin of the next person. <laughs> bing, ding, 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 ding. Shopping cart to the nuts. <laughs> Instant. 
<laughs> Takes her out. Take that, sloth! <laughs> <laughs> Fucking great. Uh, you can find out more about me here, whatever you're breaking the fourth wall for. Before them was a lustrous woman who liquefied her victims into a cure-all tonic for love, including her daughter, a pair of twins. Uh, so, uh, including her daughter, period. A pair of twins so besotted by greed that they were willing to stitch their family together to get what they wanted. And a man who was filled with such envious rage that he brutally took the lives of people who had things he wished he did. Now I am preparing to stare down a woman who is synonymous with the kind of negligence and aberrance of kindness that would make anyone's stomach turn. Oh my god, the apathy of my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Before we get into that, we have to address the elephant in the room, the warden. I just wish we had like a drum set so I could do a rim shot. <laughs> like my ex-girlfriend, right? <laughs> I think I say that joke <laughs> once per episode. Yeah, it's a common, it's a refrain, yeah. <laughs> Like my ex-girlfriend. Some of you have mentioned rather alarmingly that he isn't to be trusted. Uh, no shit. You mentioned his namesake, the way Edgar behaved around him, and the way in which he was happy to pull the plug on the whole operation when I didn't wake up. I aimed to confront him, requesting permission to go to his office from one of the guards after a short nap and time to decompress. I didn't talk to Buck, Nestor, or anyone about how the grief of losing my mother bubbled to the surface after finishing the last meal. There was no point when it was written all over my face, tears running down my face as we finished up and left the room. Buck simply hugged me as I sobbed before leaving me time to heal as he went off to explore the prison and gain intel, while Nestor went topside to give Edgar some room to fly not wanting him to be cooped up too long. After riding the lengthy elevator for a solid 15 minutes, I came to a long marble hallway with huge portraits of Greek gods doing battle. Saturn eating his own son. That's my favorite one, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, that one shows up in literally every horror game of all time. The imprisonment of the Titans in Tartarus and the violent affairs that occurred on Earth before Zeus flooded the plains. Every portrait was more macabre in nature as I ventured closer to the large chamber doors that housed the warden's office. No receptionist to ask me to wait, I simply knocked and waited for a response, hearing frantic murmuring from behind the door and a soft song playing. I knocked again and cracked the door ajar to try and call a little louder, but with an acceptable noise not wanting to cause offense if he was in a meeting. When I looked in, I could tell he was most certainly in a meeting, just not the kind I'd expected. In the center of a grand room was a prisoner, chained inside a large barrel, and submerged up to the waist in murky waters, a pool that stretched to fifty feet in diameter, small critters of all shapes and sizes sloshing about underneath the obscured surface. Two high-ranking officials stood on the other side of the barrel, taking notes and observing the warden, now without his trench coat on, and revealing a gilded sil silver waistcoat, black and gold sigils across it, with a white shirt underneath, sleeves rolled up to reveal lengthy verses written in what I assumed was Germanic, his tall frame leaner than I anticipated, not an ounce of fat on his arms or his torso. The man clearly took care of himself. Now, inmate number 855, you have been with mine establishment for quite some time, yes? I have done my best to keep you comfortable, respect, do, and ensure no harm befell you. I have done my job as I'm in Warden to keep you safe, and you repay me mit this. He brandishes a shank in front of the man, crafted from toothbrushes and a carving knife, dipped in a poison, sharp to the touch. The man thrashed in his barrel, but didn't respond. You know I take great pride in this prison, for we only house the worst of the worst. The prisoners that nobody else wants. I'm outcasts. 
He throws the shank at the wall and it sticks out, shaking as a grin flashes across his face, leaning in close and cocking his head to the side as he lightly slaps the prisoner's face. Du a nicht wanted. Und du a nicht loved. He turns his back, arms crossed behind him, and staring out of his bay window, a grand view over the general population of his expansive prison, so many types of individuals roaming the floors that were clearly not human. Lycanthropes, ursine warriors, wendigos, haired apes and regular humans all cavorting as if it were normal. He sighs and continues talking as his two associates began walking around, pouring something into the slots. I could smell the sickly scent of milk and honey mellified man rising to the surface and making me want to retch. But I resisted, my horror rooting me to the spot. They were slathering him up as bait. Does to know about scafism? 855? It is one of the worst ways to be taken out of this world. You are offered up into dirty water rife with parasites, insects, carnivorous fish, and mammals that are attracted to your soft, delicious flesh. This is what the Egyptians used to do. They used to pour, like, uh, a form of wine, a form of honeyed, sugary mead over a person, put them in a fucking canoe, and just throw them in the goddamn river and let them just fucking get eaten by whatever, Jeez. torn apart by bugs torn apart by the heat yeah nice some crazy shit they will eat you bit by bit piece by piece and you will rot for days before death comes up to claim your sorry soul the inmate finally broke their silence to protest i was trying to defend myself those blacks you know what they're like on the outside <laughs> you must understand my safety the safety of our race uh full canon uh, Django Phillips is racist. I swear to God. <laughs> but the warden held up his hand and shook his head. Let us correct something, yes, Herr Rufage. I may be German, but I took this job to capture and eliminate people like you. I have no interest in your ideas of racial purity and your appeal to my skin color insults us both. Overstepping my absolute ruling is... A slight ick cannot ignore. I have more self-respect than that. Besides, he turned and looked at me, smiling. You offended our sin eater. If you weren't a dead man before, you are now. He clicked his fingers and the two assistants submerged the barrel in the water, leaving only the head exposed and covered by a bag to muffle the inmates' pleas for clemency. The structure was then wheeled out of the room and past me, the warden smiling warmly as I shuffled awkwardly inside his study. I hope this shows that despite my cold exterior, I do have a moral compass, Frau Lockwood. He gestured to the window and I walked over to join him. We all house a manner of social offenders here from those who harm people on racial and gender prejudices to child harmers and so forth. Nobody escapes our grasp, and nobody ever will. But I feel I have lost your trust and so must be candid. He points to a cell at the bottom of Gen Pop where a large hole resided, every single inmate avoiding it like the plague as congregated. I picked up the scent of wildflowers, the taste of elderberries, and a sensation of pure, unadulterated hatred emanating from that point. Something lurked in there. Something old and powerful, eyes unseen, pierced through the darkness and tore into me, shaking my resolve to its core. Ah, you sense it too, yeah. That will be Prisoner 001, our first inmate. Some would say the father of this prison, if you exclude me, of course. He's been here since the earliest days, and you will meet him when the time is right. He's 
Not on death row? I asked, swallowing and feeling the lump in my throat. His aura was overwhelming, and I had to turn away. Not exactly, but that's not the question you came here to ask, is it, Frau Lockwood? He walked over to his drinks cabinet and picked out a bottle, black and in a casket, chains wrapped around the structure in a ceremonial manner, the front reading, The Hunter's Dream, for when your rest is nowhere in sight. He poured two whiskey glasses full of the red and black liquid, dropping a white circular block of ice into the center, almost like pure moonlight amid the cloak of night in the drink. Why do we need to eat the sins of these fucking monsters? I asked, a bead of sweat rushing down my temple as I turned away and reached for the glass, the warden sitting in his recliner, sloshing the drink around wistfully before he answered. And so comes the time where I must be candid, Frau Lockwood. There is a greater reason for your work here. One that will determine so many things beyond you, me, this prison, and the outside world. When I say you are doing the work of gods, I mean it. I down the drink in one, the burning sen sensation lining my throat and waking me from a fear-addled malaise immediately. Before I could ask, he held, he held up a hand. Ah, not for now. I must ask you to trust me on this. But you will learn in due time. However, I know trust must be regained, and so I offer you this. He pulls a document from his desk and slides it over, a headshot of a young woman with flowing black hair obscuring half her face, and a scowl written across it as pierced lips and gritted teeth glared up at me. Prisoner number 6626, Luciana Maria de Santos, a 21-year-old head of the Church of the Dusk Walkers, responsible for the Sturgeon Day of Reckoning. He slid a newspaper in front of me, the headline reading, Massacre at Sturgeon Utilitarian Church, Hundreds Dead in Mass Suicide. A photo accompanying it showcasing a sea of bodies hidden over tarps, sneakers, and shoes sticking out from the bottom of the crowd gathered outside, frozen in screams of bloody murder. So many of the shoes were child sizes. Among them would be an old friend from who I moved from when I moved to Sturgeon, someone I lost contact with so long ago, the first friend I made in the city. I am to understand that you know of this individual, someone doest uh, familiar with back home? He asked, my expression clearly betraying my desire to sow. Stoicism, I nodded. Well, then I wish for you to know something. You will get very little out of her. She is the most uncooperative of our death row inmates. Only when you show her this will you get the response you need and a relatively painless experience. He slid me a note sealed with the prison sigil and a note attached to the front stipulating not to open unless necessary. I hope this can mend bridges and assuage concern, Frau Lockwood. I carry great pride in this prison. I wish for its reputation to stay intact, whatever the case. Heading back downstairs, I was escorted by the guards straight to the visitation area, despite not being with Buck or Nestor. I protested, what but the, the guards simply shook their head, saying it was time for the interview. I packed myself down and felt a small lump in my inside of my pocket jacket, the totem, perhaps. Maybe that thing didn't get it after all. Either way, I had little time to deliberate as I was taken to the main interview room, bathed in blue light and a soft piano playing, the scent of gouda cheese and wine wafting through the cracks of the door. As I stepped in, feeling remarkably vulnerable for the first time without my trusted friends and guides, but confident in my knowledge that all of the people we'd faced thus far, this was someone I could handle. After all, I at least knew her and what she did. 
Luciana came into Sturgeon, a penniless, destitute, and drug-addled woman from the slums. No mother to speak of, and the less said of her father, the better. When she was 14, she ran away from home and began giving street corner sermons, trying to help people see what she saw in the world. A flood of people, lost in the shuffle, going about their days without cause for concern or a direction. So many lying to themselves about their beliefs, saying one thing and doing another, praying their way into heaven while rapidly crawling into the tight crevice that was the gateway to limbo with their deeds. She offered them a question. What if you were just honest with yourself if you lived life the way you were supposed to saw the things you eschewed what wonders would open up to you luciana spoke of visions from her youth as so many prophets do declaring belphegor sat on his throne of municipal waste while so many describe him as being on the toilet luciana said he sat on the gateway to a better life, only letting those truly embody his ideals and that of the greater gods through to meet them. He was a gatekeeper. In her first town, she was cast out. Many saw her as blasphemous heretical and saw no place for a woman to speak her mind on religious ideals. But her story truly came alive once she stepped foot into Sturgeon some two years later at just 16 years old. She said a man who stood where air could do not but fester and smells dulled to a point of absence offered her a check, an establishment, and a new title. Mother Accumulator. Fucking sick. So the church flourished in a building steeped in twilight at all times. St. Martin's Utilitarian Church, that's a different word. Every member that joined would go indoors, be given a thick robe and taken while blindfolded, through a cavern to a small area steeped in twilight. Revelers and fanatics said the sun was hidden behind a black moon. The entire congregation bathed in a twilight glow that invigorated them and boldened them to do things they'd never do, like their taxes on time, to reject their old traditions and gods. Still, to think this woman was responsible for the day of reckoning, it was shocking. Looking at her now, laying in a softly swaying hammock and wrapped in a fluffy blanket, softly drinking wine and looking like a basic bitch. <laughs> it was almost a total dichotomy from the person printed in the papers. I took my seat and rolled up my sleeves, tying my locks back into a bun, ensuring I was prepared. I had a feeling this would test me. Ms. DeSantos, my name is Miss Lockwood. You called upon my services in order to eat your sins before your end. I must apologize that my colleagues are not with me. They appear to be engaged elsewhere. But I feel we know each other well enough to proceed without them. Is that okay? Silence. She glanced over once before swirling her wine and downing it in one go. The glass filling up again as she sat it down, unseen hands catering to her every whim. I sighed. You also go by the name Mother Accumulator, do you not? Fucking sick name, bro, sick. <laughs> Head of the Church of the Duskwalkers, an organization I am unfortunately most familiar with. I paused, thinking of that first friend almost like an aunt to me. Her door always open when I needed advice. The coffee shop she owned, forever bustling with happy guests, would-be artists and philosophers who debated until closing time. Abigail Priestley was a gifted orator, expert coffee brewer, and lover of all animals. Her bearded dragon Montgomery always on her shoulder and crawling under her thick blonde hair whenever he got scared. But in time, she would come to face financial woes as Sturgeon faced an economic downturn and took to wandering in the streets at night, hoping for answers to her problems. When a local outreach member of the church hailed her down, that was that. She became Duskwalker Abbey, and within six months, she would be... No. I had to focus. Ms. DeSantos, this procedure cannot work without your cooperation. The other inmates... 
She waved a hand at me, twirling finely manicured fingers in a far less subdued manner than Mr. Blasnick's condescending finger wag. She merely didn't want me to continue for the sake of it. I'm not them. They're not me. We're all different in this place, and while I did call you, I had a change of heart. The gods say you're not the one, and I follow their behest. If you cannot prove your importance, then I'll simply have to fail at my task and die here, unfulfilled. My eyebrows raised at that. Failed at her task, a small stream of blue smoke began to pile in from the top of her enclosure, certainly not enough to manifest anything, but it was a start. But your followers all died at your behest. Wasn't that your great task? Getting them all to ascension? She scoffed, taking a delicate bite of some tiramisu and wiping her lips with a napkin, breathing softly and letting her slender frame sink further into the hammock, not even bothering to lift her head up to look at me. That's what the media assumed. Maybe that's what some of the newbies assumed. Those just looking for a cause to die for, but no. Every initiated follower knew exactly what we were doing. We were preparing me. Preparing my body for the next stage. I simply had to lift a hand, and they did as I asked. The laziest mass murderer this world has ever seen. My numbers do not simply exist within the halls of St. Martin's, no. We had cells all over, and they will continue to wake up and do what is written until the number is sufficiently high enough. I have nothing to do now but wait for the next step. Wait for my rightful throne in the stars. The mist began to pool around the back corner, forming a large seat, something shaking on top of it. Small, spindly hands clasping at the bottom as if trying to reach up to the seat. You say you're different to the others, but I sense similarities in you all. Each of you having a guide, a purpose, a chance to ascend. There is more going on here than simply letting you die, isn't there? I sat up, preparing to walk to the door. I will not be a pawn in someone else's game, even if the warden says otherwise. You can rot here for all I care. As I took steps to the door, her lackadaisical voice cooed after me. Do you know where you go when you die? I do. I know where everyone goes. Something made my hand freeze on the door handle, luminous. Eyes rushed into my mind as if something else was watching me. I felt compelled to turn around and continue, sitting back down with a sigh, listening to Arcade Fire. I'm listening to Arcade Fire. Go on. <laughs> it's where you go when you die. I replied, the smell of Gouda, beginning to overwhelm my nostrils and eradicate my love of cheese. Now that's one thing I gotta say, I love cheese. Cheese is like the reason I can't eat She vegan. gets a hammock... Tiramisu and wine. wine. Yeah, it's better than my day to day. It's nice, dude. <laughs> what I'm thinking is, uh, I love cheese, but like the smell of cheese overwhelmingly doesn't sound great. It'd be a lot. It'd probably be like feet. It'd be so like smell too feet. much of a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. She smiled and leaned her head up for the first time. That's not how it works. Make an offering to me, to the church. If it's good enough, I'll consider it. She took another bite and swallowed a large helping of wine. I sighed. I was either going to be her soundboard or get this done, unsure of what I could even ask to progress beyond her sermons. And then I remembered the note the warden had given me. Giving pause for just a moment, I grabbed it and heated the words on top. Let her read it first. Unsealed it and as the instructions stipulated, held it up to the plexiglass for her to read without seeing what the contents were. Within moments, her demeanor changed. She dropped the cheese and wine, hopping out of her hammock and rushing over to read it carefully, tracing each line with her finger, and then gazing at what I assumed was a picture at the bottom. 
Tears filled her eyes and the corners of her mouth curled into a wide smile of uproarious joy as she leaned back, wiping her eyes and straightening her back. Your offering is most acceptable, Madam Lockwood. I will tell you everything and impart some advice to you before the end. She walked over to the wall opposite her hammock and began painting, materials simply appearing out of nowhere as deft hands swiped across a plain canvas, her elegance never faltering when she spoke. When did your lord appear to you? I asked, trying to cast my mind back to what Buck had taught me about tulpas and their embodiments of our sins. I love tulpas. I was just a little girl when he appeared in front of me on a throne made of bone, sinew, and the bodies of so many trying to hold his frame up and comfortable. Countless little bodies, hands and legs, straining to make him happy, his body hovering over the portal to the better place. They wanted so badly to be let in, to gain favor, but he offered that only to me. Said I carried greatness within me and must go out, follow his instructions, and stay on the path. Being charismatic and beautiful certainly helped, as well as meeting one of my lords who offered sanctuary and financial security. Our following grew exponentially after that, especially when we could talk the talk and walk the walk. She paused, grabbing a deep shade of red and chuckling. When we first showed the new initiates the stars and what devoured them, their joy was rare and magnificent. It was an understanding of their placement in the world and the realization that all they had to do in order to see the next step was serve me. The blue mist had crawled up the entire back wall, huge and scaling nearly the full twelve feet in height. More bodies piled at the base of this metallic seat, their faces permanently frozen in absolute agony under the crushing weight. So you put things in place for Sturgeon's Day of Reckoning. A cool summer day in August, when the sun set and the moon had not risen. The city would wake up to a sight that would be felt across the world. We all know this, and I know this isn't your sin to confess, so let's get right to it. What was it? that they don't know. What happened to the congregation? To my friend Abby? I regretted saying it the moment her name left my lips, but I couldn't help myself. Luciana's face fell for a moment, and she picked up a yellow, bright, and warm, like Abby's hair. Ah, Duskwalker Abby, one of our trusted priestesses. She was so dedicated to the group after her life took a turn, I'm Sorry that she couldn't say goodbye before the end, but you were an outsider. You were not to know. If I have one regret, it's that I inadvertently, inadvertently slighted someone of your stature and lineage. We prepared a concoction in line with Lord Belphegor's teachings, a poison that would steadily dim the light inside to that of a twilight, in time with the last etches of light on the horizon, they would go to sleep and would thin minutes be gone. A large horned figure took shape on the throne, a hand resting under his chin while the others pushed on its leg, a scowl against its face not dissimilar to that of Lucina's mugshot. She began to paint faster with more purpose and less elegance. The poison was willingly ingested by every member of our group, over 700 souls willing to go with the sun and leave before the moon realized they'd departed. Deep underground where the twilight shone, we basked in the light, and I watched from my throne as they all praised me, praised Belphegor, praised our All-Mother and the Unnameable Ones. They fell into a deep sleep, and I was left to watch and wait, knowing this would be my final home. But wait, aren't you Mother Accumulator? I asked, not wishing to interject, but unable to ignore such an admission. She threw a stroke with her brush across the obscured canvas, the colors practically glowing from it and bathing her in a strange hue. I am. But she is Omnia Matrum. The woman who founded our movement, and was there on the first day of operations at the behest of our lord. She was no longer with us by the time that I took over, but her spirit was always an influence. 
Of course, there were complications. The poison did not react the same way with everyone. I would guess a third of the congregation did slumber. Another third were quiet but visibly unable to find any respite, and the last simply screamed, writhing and gurgling as the poison wreaked havoc on their bodies. I was uncomfortable at first, but Belphegor told me that this was my own test. He instructed me to do something that would cement my legacy as the church's finest ruler. The mist had finished forming. A red-horned ogre sat atop a bone throne with countless damned souls either trying to hold him up, escape, or get into the black hole his body hovered over. It was easy to see how it was misinterpreted as a toilet, but all I saw was a throne literally built on the labors of those who had worked for him. At the same time, my plate started to fill up and my stomach growled. The sins we eat do not ever add onto our actual diet, and we never retain the food, but for the time we smell, taste, touch, and eat it. It's real. And my stomach could not have been happier as my eyes met the growing plate. The most succulent feast, bacon-wrapped filet mignon with a French cabernet, a wheel of various brie, gouda, and blue cheese, potatoes a gratin with a molten chocolate cake for dessert. Django does a dance because it sounds like he's on board with that shit. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, honestly, I love that. I'm all about that oh, stuff. Yeah. I knew there had to be something to it, but my hunger did not care. The job was not quite done, however, and I was determined to see this one through. What did you do, Luciana? What did you do that truly put you in this place and with the sin of sloth? She finished her painting, tying her matted black hair back into a bun and placing her hands on her hips, turning it toward me and temporarily blinding me with its brilliance and the sheer light from the bioluminescent paint. I walked amid the sea of the dead. I saw so many at peace, but so many more still struggling to reach the goal. Children, babies, screaming out for their mothers for me, but I simply looked down at them with pity and did nothing but observe as they struggled. All children of the dusk must walk that path on their own. I watched so many pass over that threshold and did not leave until I knew each member of my flock had transcended. That is true godlihood. That is the legacy of Luciana Maria de Santos, mother accumulator of the Church of the Duskwalkers, bringer of the Day of Reckoning, and most importantly... My eyes adjusted to the painting as an alarm began ringing out, sirens blaring throughout the facility, and the warden's panicked voice calling over the tannoy. Acton! Attention! Inmate number 9400 has captured two of our guests. This facility is in lockdown. Frau Lockwood, please report to Central Ling immediately. They will not speak with us. Buck. Nestor. That's why they haven't turned up. I wish I could have reacted in that moment and gotten up to rush to their aid, but my eyes were adjusting to the painting in front of me and the image of Luciana walking without any reservations to the back of the room where Belphegor sat, still towering over her petite frame even when she sat down. It was the utmost pleasure that I got to find out who you truly were, where you came from, Madam Lockwood. Your mother did great things for us, truly great things. A word of advice, if you let it in, it will take everything. Good luck. We'll see one another again, maybe in a bar between spaces. I could not take my eyes off of the painting, my hands shoveling the food into my mouth mechanically without pause for thought or concern, the sounds of Luciana being pulled apart and shoved into the hole in the seat filling my ears with not a scream or a groan from her. She truly accepted her fate as an observer, sick as she may be. The painting was that of my mother, young, beautiful. As I remembered her, her afro large and with a pink comb embedded in the side that I constantly used to play with. She was laughing with a pair of dungarees on and holding a younger me on her shoulder. 
Around her neck was a large pendant with the keyhole over a locket, a sigil synonymous with the Church of the Duskwalkers, and a title engraved in the top, To Omnium Matrim, Edelor Magnia Gloria. I knew that phrase. It was the same one both my mother and grandmother repeated, drilled into me when things got tough, a phrase the Lockwood family kept close and was not known outside of that context. How did she know? The food began to turn to rot in my mouth. Looking down at the leftovers in the food, I saw creatures crawling through the remnants, festering, pulsing rot infused with the popping maggots and fungus, the fetid stench reminding me it was the result of one's laziness and the efforts of others. Tears in my eyes from the horrific food, the overwhelming fear of my friend's safety pushing me to rush, and the horrific realization my mother, my idol, was not what she seemed. I spoke the Latin phrase aloud in English and tearfully swallowed the last bite before rushing to save my friends. Inmate number 6626 Luciana Maria de Santos, a.k.a. Mother Accumulator for the Church of the Dusk Walkers. Sin, sloth, food, a gourmet of delights rotted due to negligence and inaction built off the backs of the others. Through great pain comes glory. Damn. It's a solid fucking story. Solid. It's a solid fucking solid. series. I, I, I gotta admit, and I didn't want to say it earlier to not, like, take any wind out of the sails mm-hmm. or anything, but something about, like, an incel inmate who did nothing but murder a couple people, like, didn't seem befitting to me mm, okay. in this in this series it felt a little too reddit no sleep sure for me um i guess i just prefer things to be more fucked up like that yeah you know, like a cult sure this is this is a religious cult that poisoned its members she by hand poisoned each of them and watched each of them die right. in front of her uh and and let that happen um you know that that is her sin but also we're getting like tie in now with her her whole story. What's her deal? Where's the senior from? What was her mother about? What's that whole that whole thing? The 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 last inmate also knew about the um Yeah. The monster that's that's creeping around in her in her head. Yeah. Maybe that maybe that has something to do with uh all related, all with tied what's going in on. together. You um you in. assumed from day one that sh- this chick had a demon that she was eating for uh, and that that may very well be the case. Yeah, but now she I don't be, think that's true at all. She, no, I, I'm starting to see it. I think she consumes to feed something else. Like a, a, a consumptive demon. I know? think that's exactly what is happening. But I thought at the beginning we were going to get a, a turnabout at the end where she was like, I've been a little unreliable narrator. And like, oh. this is my plan all along. I don't think not this is a the, surprise. No, I don't think this is the case. She's anymore. learning. So it she's learning that her family has a, a long history of, of uh, turning into werewolves. And, and she's only now just coming to terms with the fact that her arms are getting hairier. That's it. <laughs> like, That's exactly it. <laughs> you thought she knew she was a werewolf all along. And right. Is, and has just been leading us down. But she's finding out she's a werewolf a with path us. To, th- to throw our silver with bullets us. down a fucking sewer. And drain. she'll have a choice at the end. Whether she wants to be a werewolf or a where no or a or a person, so I I don't know I I I'm guess still this is my question yeah what did the manager ask the guy applying for the cook position at the Chinese restaurant um <laughs> uh want to go for a walk. You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, except walk in this case was W O K. Yeah, right. This is no, a Chinese restaurant. That is the joke. <laughs> yeah, that is the joke in both cases. And you even said one of the punchlines. So I don't. You would have known that yeah. that was the joke. No, yeah. I'm 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 explaining it. A because... walk is a cooking vessel. Um, <laughs> It's really predominant in a lot of Southeast Asian... a lot Asian, of Oriental types uh, of, of cooking. Of cuisine. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> hey, maybe we'll get to an Asian prisoner and I can do an awful impersonation of an Asian oh, guy God, dude. for like 40 minutes uh, while he talk about how oh, God. I put I put baby in walk. <laughs> I saw that line coming of the inmate who, the Aryan inmate, who was like, I remember the Aryan Brotherhood? And he was like, oh, I got the shiv to fend off the blacks. I saw it coming down the screen. Yeah. And I was like, man, I wonder if he's going to want me to read that. <laughs> And I made you, and now it's canon now that it's you're canon. a vehement racist. Damn it! It's going up on the wiki. <laughs> Not only is your name Django Phillips Shit. as a way to reclaim the name Django from Damn the it. blacks. <laughs> Damn it! Oh, uh, shit. Well, this has been Sin Eater uh, episode two with Django Phillips. Um, solid fucking story. I give my life... Not for honor, but for you. I appreciate In it. In my time, <laughs> there'll be no one else. I still got there in the end. I, I appreciated it. Um, we'll be back soon for uh, part three. Part of of Sin Eater. Trace. Any anything you want to leave us with? Any any anecdotes from the episode? Any any fun facts? Fun things? Koala bears. They're not sloths, but they are. Koala bears are so stupid. Yeah. That they will not recognize clipped eucalyptus leaves as food, and they won't eat them. Because they are used to seeing them in the on wild. On the tree. And, just and they cannot shake, fucking shake understand that someone would take the leaf them off the tree and, and put and it on And stand table. in front of them and chop and, them. And shake it and at then, them. And then, and look put at this. It, and then put it in front of them. <laughs> no. It's not the same. It's funny. I could say the same thing about some of our friends. <laughs> Boom. 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 However Seinfeld fucking ends. That's how it ends. Away to the days and when the moon is high and little lies with the tide with the lust for life out. A mess of army and we'll run us a whore and then we'll look across the land until we stand at the shore. Away to the days and when the moon is high and little lies with the tide with the lust for life out. A mess of army and we'll run us a whore and then we'll look across the land until we stand at the shore.